SOTA CBD products are scientifically proven and dermatologist approved to help with insomnia, overexposure to outside environmental elements, and other inflammatory issues. Scientific research is the starting point for every product they make, and SOTA products are formulated to specifically address sleep and anxiety, environmental damage, as well as inflammation and pain, both systemically and topically. SOTA CBD is purposeful in providing scientifically studied ingredients that are proven to work and then infused with CBD to target very specific disease states that many face every day. Go ahead, use coupon code FINDINGGENIUS, all one word, for a 25% discount at checkout. Visit SOTACBD.com to shop now. Use code FINDINGGENIUS. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of a Finding Genius Foundation. Uh, Today I have John Mulligan, He's the CEO of Good Therapeutics. Uh, John's been a scientist and an executive with 30 years of experience in research management, drug discovery, company formation, and business development. Uh, Before he was at Good Therapeutics, he was the founder and CEO of Glycostasis. Uh, There, he invented a glucose-responsive insulin technology, uh, which was sold to Eli Lilly in 2015. So, John, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. If you would, tell me a little bit about your background and what got you to Good Therapeutics, and then we'll go into what Good Therapeutics does. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I've been interested in biology all of my life, so I was fascinated by you know fish and animals as a kid. In I was an undergrad at MIT and took genetics class from Boris Magasanik, and that just was totally fascinating to me. And that's something that I've pretty much stuck with through my career was an interest in the application of genetics as a biological tool. I studied in the biology department doing plant genetics or bacterial genetics at Stanford and in the biochemistry department at Stanford doing plant genetics with uh, Ron Davis and then helped set up one of the human genome projects at Stanford. And that program was a super interesting area. The human genome project was interesting for me because it combined the this engineering approach to biology with genetics, where for a geneticist, the idea of working on a fully sequenced organism, which seems really trivial and obvious now, was just a fascinating possibility when uh, that was just getting going. In the process of being involved in the Human Genome Project, I saw something that had been a tool, really an important tool when I was a graduate student, blossom into a completely new technology that's still continuing to grow. But during that time, between the time I was a graduate student and when I worked in the Human Genome Project, there was a you know multi-thousand-fold gain in productivity of this central tool for biology, the, re- the ability to read DNA sequences. So when I was in graduate school, three or four of us spent a few months to sequence a 3KB fragment and then spent years studying that DNA sequence. But by the time I left the genome project, there were, you know, the productivity was at least a few thousand fold higher in terms of amount of DNA sequence generated per dollar or per person. And it's many orders of magnitude higher now. After leaving the human genome project, I took a job at a company called Darwin Molecular. And that combined my interest in sequencing and in genetics. The idea for Darwin Molecular was to apply this new coming human genome sequence to drug discovery, to try to build an integrated company that would do chemistry and immunology and genetics to change the way that uh, the pharmaceutical industry found drugs. It turned out to be an overly ambitious project, but the one of the, the cool things that came out of that company was uh, one of the projects from my group we were charged with doing was applying genetics and sequencing to finding new drug targets. So when we started, we thought like everybody else did about 
studying disease mechanisms. So we did projects on psoriasis. We cloned some Alzheimer's genes, studied a, a progeria gene, which led to you know diseases of aging in children. But in looking through a lot of different human genetic syndromes with our collaborators, we noticed a group in South Africa that had a disease that was, it was a fatal disease of bone growth. So these are people with a disease called sclerosteosis, and they had, their bones continued to grow as adults, and they had extremely strong bones. And what I realized, and I was sitting across the table from a, a guy named Jeff Vaness, and the two of us together realized that we were looking at a genetic model of a drug. We'd been thinking about genetics as a tool for finding disease mechanism and then looking at disease mechanism to find drugs. But what we had was a recessive mutation in humans, a loss of function mutation, which leads to high bone density and increasing bone density that in, in, continues to increase in adults. And so what drugs do in general is block the activity of something. So what we had was a genetic model of a drug. And so that project really was one of the biggest things that came out of Darwin Molecular and, and resulted now almost 20 years later in a drug that was approved by Amgen a couple of years ago, an antibody to the uh, gene product that was found through studying that mutation. And it, it, it is a treatment for osteoporosis. So when you give people this antibody, their bone density increases because you're blocking a negative regulator of bone density. What are the problems, though, in that situation where the bones will just keep growing and growing throughout a person's life? Actually, what the first thing that happened was that they untreated died in their 20s because their skull crushed their brain stem, continued growth of the skull. So the treatment for it was actually to cut a chunk of the bone out of the skull and relieve the pressure of that growth. Uh, but the bones are so strong, it took like specially designed surgical tools to do this treatment. It's an extremely rare disease. Uh, there were only 30 or 50 people in the world that had the disease. But but by studying that, we learned how to treat or a, a, a one way to treat a really important, you know, super common disease, uh, osteoporosis. I left Darwin Molecular in uh, after about five years, and i in the course, I, my academic training had been completely focused on genetics, but in the course of working in this first biotech, I got really interested in what works and doesn't work about businesses and decided to start my own company to try to do a better job of making a, a really working business. And the company I started was called uh, Blue Heron Biotechnology. It was a synthetic biology company. And what we were doing was to synthesize genes. And so... Again, it's something that's pretty obvious now, but at that point, we were at a stage when DNA sequencing was exploding. And so there's this tremendous amount of information about genetics, about the sequence of organisms, people and model organisms. But there wasn't a really easy way to take that data out of the computer and put it back into the lab where you could do experiments. And so the idea with Blue Heron was to build a company that would to automation for gene synthesis, where people could have a website, paste in a DNA sequence, and we'd send them back a clone carrying that sequence. A relatively new idea at that point. And what I wanted to do was I'd seen this multi-thousand-fold increase in productivity between doing it by hand and doing it in a, in a kind of factory automated way and sequencing. And the idea behind Blue Heron was to do the other direction to take the sequencing takes DNA molecules and converts it into data in the computer. And the idea there was to take DNA sequence in the computer and convert that back into a DNA molecule. Spent about 10 years on that company and before selling it to a, another company that was also doing supplying genes. It was a tremendous learning experience. It's kind of like MBA by the School of Hard Knocks. So the CBD products are formulated with scientifically proven and all natural ingredients that a dermatologist approved to help with improving sleep and inflammatory skin diseases to support overall wellness. They're offering our listeners a generous 25% off their first purchase. Use coupon code FINDINGGENIUS. No spaces in there, one word, Finding Genius to save 25% at checkout site-wide. To do so, visit SotaCBD.com. That's S-O-T-A-C-B-D.com. 
Okay. Coming to present day with uh, good therapeutics, what, what's the, the main focuses of the company? Yeah. So after Blue Heron, there was one intermediary company that called Glycostasis. And it was kind of in some ways conceptually the precursor of good therapeutics. And so I spent a couple of years after selling Blue Heron, doing some business development work, consulting a bit, and then ran across what seemed like a really interesting problem. There was a, a good description of why making a glucose responsive insulin would be valuable. And it occurred to me that it should be possible to do that by engineering a protein that would control the level of free insulin. And so the goal for glycostasis was to design an antibody that would bind, would circulate in the blood and bind the insulin in an inactive form where the affinity of that antibody would vary with glucose concentration. So when glucose is high, the antibody would affinity would go down and it would release insulin. But when glucose went down, the antibody affinity would go back up and pull the insulin back out of circulation. And so that the, the idea there was based on that the idea that there are a lot of natural proteins that do something called allosteric regulation. It's kind of a shape shifting mechanism where proteins can have two different shapes and alternate back and forth between those shapes based on binding to a signaling molecule. And so what I wanted to do was to design that kind of regulation into a protein. In this case, it would be the affinity of the antibody would vary with glucose concentration. Spent about a year learning about diabetes and trying to raise money for the company. Got wasn't able to do venture funding uh, based, not surprisingly, since the whole concept was, in principle, this should be possible, but did talk a nonprofit called the Pacific Northwest Diabetes Research Institute into giving me lab space and supply money to work on the project. I spent about two years in the lab and built a, a model molecule that actually did this, where it was an antibody whose affinity for insulin varied with glucose concentration. And then spent about a year in business development trying to partner with pharma and ended up selling that to Eli Lilly. And so I left there knowing that you could design molecules to do this and, and wanted to apply it in, in other areas. And so I founded Good Therapeutics along with Carl Handelsman of Codon Capital. He and I seed funded the company. And the idea for Good Therapeutics was to generalize this shape shifting regulation and apply that to other therapeutic needs. And the basic concept is using antibodies to sense molecules in the body and that use the antibody to drive the change in shape that would control the activity of another, of a therapeutic domain. And the potential applications of, of having a, a drug that actually can sense its surroundings and decide whether or not to be on and off were really broad. And so I spent a couple of years Actually, I ended up being about three years working in a lab with just two of us working, studying to figure out where the, it, we can best apply this concept and ended up after talking to a lot of potential partners, pharmaceutical companies, scientists, ended up narrowing in on the regulation of cytokines for oncology applications. So cytokines are, mo are small molecules in the, or proteins in the body that regulate the activity of the immune system. And there'd been this tremendous interest in the last five or 10 years in oncology. And instead of trying to kill cancer cells, trying to re-educate the immune system to kill the cancer cells. And so that was the kind of genesis of the company applying this idea for allosteric regulation to therapeutic regulation of the immune system for oncology. So what is the, the main mechanism of actions of the, uh, of the products you're making at Good Therapeutics? Are you intending to regulate cytokine expression or? Well, so what we're it? doing, I can give you an example of our, our lead project. It's a, a checkpoint antibody. So it's an anti PD1 antibody that regulates the activity of a cytokine called IL2 or interleukin 2. And so the, this first wave of excitement about immuno oncology came with the successful development of checkpoint antibodies. And these are antibodies that block negative regulation on T cells that can then kill cancer cells. And so when you give a checkpoint antibody to a cancer patient, it unleashes a set of T cells that can then go in and kill the tumor cells. It's 
a fantastically effective treatment, but it only works on you know, 30 to 50% of patients. So there's this tremendous interest in expanding the range of patients that will work for us. It only works on some solid tumor indications, and even on the ones where it works, it doesn't work on all patients. So we combined it with IL-2 because IL-2 is a signal that stimulates and expands the population of T-cells that can kill tumor cells. And so the tumor-specific T-cells express this PD-1 molecule on the surface, this checkpoint molecule. What our drug does is to bind that, bind and block the PD-1 molecule, so blocking a negative signal. And then when it's on the surface, it changes shape and allows the IL-2 to act on that, on the, that specific cell. And what that does is expand the number of tumor-specific T cells in the body. And we've shown in mouse models, we've got this super exciting data in mouse models showing that we can increase the number of tumor-killing T cells and increase their activity without targeting all of the other cells that respond to IL-2. So IL-2 was one of the first cytokines approved 20 or 30 years ago, but it's never been widely used because it's incredibly toxic. It winds up the immune system and to such an extent that it's when patients are treated with IL-2, they have to be, has to be done in an intensive care ward. And it's, so what we've done is create a molecule that with exquisite precision targets that IL-2 activity to this set of T cells that are capable of killing tumor cells, but doesn't act on all of the other IL-2 responsive cells that lead to the toxicity. Is there a, um, a CSAR in terms of specificity versus power, IL-2 versus others? Or yeah, molecules that's that you a good create? question. So it's not clear. If this, pro- this certainly doesn't do all of the positive things that IL-2 does. It just targets very in a very narrow way a specific set of cells that are powerfully able to kill tumor cells. But it doesn't... Um, it doesn't do everything IL-2 does. It doesn't do all the good parts and it doesn't do the bad parts either. So yeah, there is a trade-off between specificity and, and its broad capabilities. So how would you characterize the, uh, the method of action or effectiveness of what you've created? You know, I know that sounds proprietary, but what can you say um, about how yours works? So if a very small percentage of the cells that, well, let me just start over again. Actually, could no you problem. say that? Well, I, oh, what I was going to ask you is, um, you know, I know that, a lot of your work is probably proprietary, but what can you say about the method of action of how your compound works and the, you know, the efficacy, what it targets and et cetera? Should I, should I ask you a different question instead? Yeah, Maybe actually. Can... I'm... Oh, no problem. Yeah. Um, what kind of conditions are most amenable to the new compound methodology that you found? Specific types of cancers or what conditions? Oh, I asked you about, you know, the, again, the seesaw effect of the more targeted, the yeah. less the effect, maybe the less targeted, the more the effect. The treat. Yeah, so we think that what this molecule will, will apply at first is in solid tumor types that respond partly to checkpoint inhibition. So it's like a checkpoint antibody with an extra superpower. So it has the ability to not just unleash a set of cells, but to cause that population to expand and to be more active. And so we think it, the first applications will be in tumor types that show some response to checkpoint, but don't aren't completely cured or not all patients are respond to checkpoint. And it'll also be applied to patients that develop resistance or the tumors develop resistance to this uh, therapy. Are there specific solid tumors that uh, you know the, the clinical trials are covering? Like what what stage is your compound? Yeah, so right our now? this molecule is we've just. Uh, are in the process of choosing a clinical candidate. So we have great animal data in mice. We're now, by the end of, by sort of the first half of this year, we'll have chosen a particular version of that to start preclinical development on. So it'll go into manufacturing, talk studies, with an aim of putting it into people in a first phase one study, probably early in 2024. And the exact choice of tumor types will come over the next couple of years. It's not secret It's at this point. It's just that it's not clear. There's a lot more that's being learned all the time. And so by the time we actually go into the clinic, we'll have a clearer idea of which places to apply it first. 
How long, um, I know the pathway is never known, but how long do you think it'll be until this is in clinical use? Is it quite a long time? Or how long? Yeah, it's a, it takes a long time. So it'll be a year and a half or two years before we first put it into people. And then it could be another five to seven years after that before it's approved and but for general use. But it'll be uh, first tried in you know dose escalation studies and patients that have been heavily pretreated in a number of different areas, TBD at this point. Okay. Well, very good. What's next in the pipeline that you can describe again? What are you guys looking at as this is going through clinical trials? Is that all consuming or do you have time to work on other compounds? And yeah, that's a great question. So we've our strategy as a company is to take molecules into phase one where we have human proof of concept that they'll work and then to partner them at that stage. But part of our business development strategy is to start talking with other companies early. We've been talking with multiple potential partners really since the company started, and that's really helped us focus on where best to apply the technology, which sensor therapeutic pairs to work on next. And in the course of these discussions, we've generated interest, particularly in the PD-1 aisle too. So it's possible that that will be partnered sometime in the next couple of years, maybe even before it hits phase one. We have a number of other cytokines that we're working on, another T-cell regulating cytokine called IL-12. The other cytokine that's been approved, IL-2 and interferon alpha, are the two cytokines that have been approved for cancer like IL-2, interferon alpha is also very toxic. And so we're now, we're working on a number of methods to target interferon alpha to target its activity just to tumors. So regular, turning them on and turning interferon alpha on only in the tumor microenvironment. Particularly the project that's most advanced there is a, a pdl one regulated interferon alpha that would bind to pdl one expressed on tumors and on antigen presenting cells in the tumor microenvironment and help to shift that environment towards a more tumor, expand the number of antigen presenting cells and shift the environment towards a more immune responsive and a more an environment that's more capable of allowing the immune system to attack the cancer cells. Um, I guess last question, um, through the compounds you guys are working on, any insights into how various cancers can you know, either fool or hide from our immune system or turn it off selectively? Yeah, so there's a lot of interest in the mechanisms for that. And one of the other areas that we're working on is a what's called a TGF-beta sink. And so TGF-beta is a regulatory molecule that suppresses the immune system and stimulates the growth of fibroblasts that block access of the immune system to cancers. And so what we're going to do, we're trying to make as a molecule that will block the activity of TGF-beta. So instead of bringing a cytokine in, and in, in this case, we're blocking the activity of immunosuppressive molecule. Yeah, very interesting. So it's a little here, a little there. Yeah. You know, yeah. Blocking the suppression, tuning stuff up, et cetera. Okay. Makes sense. Well, very good. We're, um, we're just about out of time. What's the best way for people to find out more about good therapeutics? Where can they go? They can go to goodtherapeutics.com, the website, where we've got great pictures of uh, the concept of, of this systemic delivery and local action and some a description of some of the projects that we're working on. Excellent. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks. Remember, before you go, ask yourself, do you want better sleep? How about better overall skin? Using SOTA CBD products is one of the best things you can do for your overall wellness. Get your CBD-infused products from a company who uses proven scientific research to help support wellness and treat inflammatory skin diseases. SOTA CBD is giving our listeners 25% off their first purchase. Just use coupon code FINDINGGENIUS at checkout. Save 25% site-wide. Go to SOTACBD.com to shop. S-O-T-A-C-B-D.com. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. 
This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.